This week doesn't get any easier, at least in my household, and we're talking about anger. I don't know what anger's like in your household, but for me, uh, this one can be a tough spot sometimes. Paul wrote about it in Ephesians. He said this, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I've never had trouble with the first part, in your anger. I could always get right to in my anger. I can come up with a list of things that make me angry, and I bet you could too. And yet, what the scripture teaches us really, really quickly this morning is that there's a way that there can be something that's an injustice, a frustration, something that has offended you deeply. You know that, that in your core, something has wronged you, and yet it doesn't have to provoke you to sin. It doesn't have to be destructive to relationships. As a matter of fact, you could actually find health in your soul in your response to something that was an injustice. And, and, and so it seems as though it's not the act of anger that's wrong. There's a deeper issue that we've got to look at. You see, anger expresses itself in a, in a variety of different ways. You might be the slow burn kind of person in your house. You know, people like that, and, and they boil a little bit at a time. You, you can tell if you know them well that they're getting angry. And at some point, they're going to boil over. They're going to snap. They're going to say that thing that finally shows you that there's, there's something wrong inside. Now, I wasn't raised like that. We were a little bit more expressive in our anger. It was okay to be expressive. You might come from that background, too. People who are a little quiet or slower burns don't always like us aggressive types that want to go right to the source of the anger, right? Let's have verbal confrontation. What if, we just, uh, what if we just settle it right here? What if we just have the disagreement and you can just feel your skin crawl? And, and maybe you were the third type. Maybe you were passive aggressive. They're the best, aren't they? Don't you love passive aggressive comments? Where you're like, I think they're mad at me. And it'll go right over your head. You know, and us aggressive types are like, I missed the quiet type. I missed the passive aggressive type because they weren't yelling directly at me. And, and nonetheless, regardless of how you express anger, we all feel it. And if you'd slow down through your week and look, you would see a variety of different places where the activity of anger is something that you're always trying to bite your lip, that you're always trying to knuckle through and trying to, to save face. We know that it's wrong to get so mad. It's just that there's times when it gets the best of us. You know the old conversation with your kids when, when one of your kids would get mad at the other and you would send them out, now go apologize to your sister. I don't know how many times I've said that this week. Now go in the other room, apologize to your mother, apologize to your sister. And you hear the apology. If you listen to kids apologize, we do the same thing, but they'll say something like, I'm sorry, but. You ever put that word in your apology? You ever do that? Maybe you don't say it because you're, you're socially cued up enough to know that, that you can't put that there, but you're thinking it. But it's the justification behind why you're mad. I'm sorry, uh, but, but uh, you don't know how stressed I've been at work. I'm sorry, but, but you don't know what, what life's been like this week. I get mad when people drive too fast and they, and they tailgate me. If I'm behind them, I get mad when people drive too slow. I, I didn't mean to get mad, but you were driving too slow. You were driving too fast. Either way, it's your fault. It's not my fault. I'm sorry, but but it's you. But if you wouldn't have done your thing, I wouldn't have this anger problem that now I'm finding out biblically might be a sin problem. And, and so there's a, there's a real problem here. I'm sorry, but I'm stressed from work. I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry, but here's the real truth. Is that some of us have real legitimate things that have cultivated anger in us. And you could ask anybody if you were justified in your anger. But we've been treating the symptoms of our anger instead of the source. And so if we don't go to the source of what's broken inside of us, we're going to miss the bigger picture. James asked, the half-brother of Jesus asked the early church in chapter 4, verse 1. He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Just ask yourself. Because your instinct will be to go to the sentence after the but. And then he asks this rhetorical question, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? We've got to be real careful where we assign the blame of our anger to. When I was uh, 22, I was newly married and I was working in construction. 
I was working uh, in Morse on a side street. We'd been grinding streets. If you ever have been uh, caught in the summertime behind the grinder, uh, I was doing that job. We'd had a skid steer out there and, and, and had ground these little piles. And my job for the day, it wasn't a bad job, was to shovel and clean up all of these small piles of grindings. And so it was me and an operator, an operator in the skid steer, me with a shovel. And for this particular day, I had kind of had in this lottery pick this operator who didn't want to be there. He had felt like he wasn't getting enough work through the week. And and so this was an easy day where if we didn't clean up too fast, we could stretch an eight-hour day into a 10-hour day, and he was out to take full advantage of it. But the way that an operator stretches the day is by not scooping the pile with the machine. Instead, by parking in front of a pile and pointing at the laborer, me in this circumstance, and saying, just shovel it all into the bucket. And I obliged for about three hours. And then the sun got a little bit hotter, and I asked him, passive-aggressively, if he would maybe do his job a little bit more efficiently. If he would maybe, maybe you could, you know, use this machine, you could hit that pile. And I wouldn't have to shovel quite so much. And he said, you're the laborer, why don't you just do what you're in charge of? Okay, okay. And I bit my lip for another hour, and finally I hit a breaking point. We came up to a big pile of grindings. He parked the machine, and I'll tell you what what made me go over the edge. He parked the the machine, he put the bucket down, he shut the machine off, stretched his feet outside of the door, and leaned back as he lit a cigarette so that I could keep shoveling. And as I was shoveling, I wasn't looking, I just was staring until finally I dropped the shovel. And I jumped like a cat onto the bucket (laughs) to the door of the machine, This was pre-COVID, so I was inches away from him, no fear at all, you know? And I just stared in, and I said, what? You know, it was already out that I was going to go into ministry, and so people already knew, like, that I should fight and speak differently, so there was no swearing, there was nothing inappropriate, I was still fighting inside the boundaries I'd created for myself, but I lost it. I told him how much of a failure he was as an operator, he was never going to cut it at this company, I would be better off out here alone, just me and a shovel, like, all these things, and I, I finally got it all off my chest, and I turned around, and here sat in the middle of the street a minivan waiting to go around us. And I heard a giggle, and it was a woman attending this church in my small group. (laughs) And she thought it was as funny as you do. And I could hear her giggle, and she thought she was cute when she rolled the window down and said, Hey, Pastor Nick, how's your afternoon going? And I just, I'll tell you something. We all have that story. We were were joking about it this week. We all have the story of where our anger got the best of us. You lost your temper on something. And it was one of those moments when it's not the heart issue that you're embarrassed was found out. It's the activity of your anger that you're embarrassed of. It's, it's the activity that we're embarrassed of. So we have conditioned ourselves. We, we read scripture about, in your anger, do not sin. And we go, okay, I'm going to button up the activity of my anger. I'm going to manage it. I'll just, I'll just clench my fist a little tighter. I'll bite my lip. I'll, I'll take a walk. I'll try to ignore the source of your problem. James calls us out on it. Doesn't it come from a desire that battles within you? It sneaks up on you, doesn't it? I'm telling you, we've found contentment in tempering the actions of our anger. We're content with, with, with not gesturing inappropriately. We're content with biting our lip. I'm, I'm telling you, there's a deeper problem with a deeper solution. We have an anger problem because we have a control problem. We think that we're the best authority. We assume ourselves to always be right, and we do this in our earthly relationships, and inadvertently we do this in our relationship with God. It's the, it's the culprit of sin is assuming that we know better than God. And so an anger problem becomes a control problem, becomes a sin problem, and it's justified by whatever follows the but. And you and I quickly can go to a list of reasons why we're still right. And it's a stronghold. It's going to keep you there. Jesus was so disinterested in getting you to act right, and he constantly drove inward to the source. There was no shortcut in fixing the problem. You had to get to the source. In your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus teaches uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And throughout this series, we're gonna, we're, you're going to see the Sermon on the Mount 
come in and out of a lot of these, uh, a lot of these sermons because there's so much practical application to what godly living looks like through the words of Jesus Christ himself inside of the sermon. Matthew chapter five, Jesus talks about anger and we come right out of the gate in verse 21 in full agreement with Jesus. Nobody in the audience, nobody this day would be in disagreement with Jesus and he said these words. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And we were all in agreement. When God set up a people, when God gave a people a law, when he gave them the Ten Commandments, it was right in there. Thou shalt not murder. Differentiated God's people from the rest of the world. That, that we understood a, a value to life. But Jesus doubles down on it and goes deeper with it, as he always did, verse 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. You'll get the same consequence as the murderer. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, is answerable. This confrontational phrase in Jewish is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Seems a little heavy-handed, Jesus. We went from murder to being angry. And you're telling me the same consequence to my anger. I've been biting my lip. I've been doing the right thing. I've been, I've been doing my part. You've even said things like, looking like a Christian. I'm trying to do it. And I keep trying. I keep the activity in, in mind. And if it wasn't for what comes after the but, I'd be so much better off. It's the rest of the world and how lost and confused they are that's got me in this angry position. And yet it's me who's going to suffer the consequence according to Jesus. In your anger, do not sin. There are reasons to be angered. But it shouldn't lead you to sin. And it shouldn't lead you to hiding what's really on your heart. The consequence of our sin is eternal separation from God. Jesus' words, dangers of the fire of hell for our anger. I tell you something, if you're not careful, you just heard yourself say but. Didn't you? If you just rhetorically were honest with yourself, I get what you're saying, Nick. I get what the scripture says, but you don't understand how I was raised. You don't understand the contention inside of our household, inside of our marriage. You don't understand how tight things are. Hear me out on this. We've got to get to the source. Because Jesus says there's a, there's a deadly consequence to our anger. And we've got to get to the healing part of it. Jesus goes so far, verse 23 is to teach this. He said, therefore, follow along with this, if you are offering your gift at the altar and, and, and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. You see, Jesus went to the altar on our behalf. So we're outside of the practice of temple worship. We don't even think temple worship logic. But imagine if going to the altar, going to atone for sin, going to be made right before God, in that, what, what Jesus calls you to is a different response. He said, if you're trying to make things right with me, in relationship with me, step one, go and make things right with your brother or sister. There's a problem here because I don't, I don't want your corrupted heart. I, I want in full genuineness to, to come before me, to come before me with integrity and go, hey, I've, I've got a source problem here, Jesus. And so I want to go make it right with this person across the table from me. I want to be made right before you. There's nothing I can put on the altar to justify my anger. There's nothing that comes after the but. The only thing sufficient is Jesus. So we have to go to the source to be fixed. Jesus even gives practical instruction in verse 25. He said, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you won't get out until you've paid the last penny. You might be left up to the consequence of somebody else who's angry if you can't be the peacemaker. I'm going to tell you something. If your 
checking us out or checking out a relationship with God, you're curious, then you should understand that if you haven't seen us as, as Christ followers living this out, that's not on God, that's on us. And we've missed an opportunity to love you well. Jesus followers, you should be absolutely boring to fight with. You should be just boring when it comes to confrontation. Because you're so at peace on the bigger picture of what Christ has done for you. Andy Stanley said this, I read this this week and it just cut me to the heart all week. He said, hurting people because they hurt you doesn't end the cycle, it perpetuates it. And it makes you look like the person you dislike. It stings, doesn't it? Remember, remember when mom used to say, don't lower yourself to their level? It's hard to do, isn't it? Especially when we've already justified our action after the but. Yeah, I might be a little wrong, but. Yeah, maybe I'm sorry, but. When you get to the source of Jesus, when you come before Jesus, there has to be a heart change. And here's why you need to change your heart and not just your actions. You remember when you were a kid um, and, and the, the fear of the dark, even if you weren't an afraid of the dark person, when those moments of, of different circumstance and fear would kind of creep in? For me, it was always out on the farm. There was always a long walk. I've told this a dozen times. There was always a long walk from our house way out back to where the shop was, and the shop was where you'd play basketball. So you might make it out to the shop in the daylight, but then you had this long walk back through the dark before you would end up back at the house again. And as a teenage boy with a whole lot of ego, last week pride, okay, I'll watch it again, I would, I would button it up and try to walk as though I had no fear. I have no fear about what's around the corner of that grain bin. I have no fear what might be in that dark corner of the shed. And so I would walk, but then as I would walk, the pace would pick up, right? Because I, I, I always was wondering, like, what the mystery might be. That fear is that there might be what? There might be somebody so enraged, angry, that they could jump out. They're hiding in Verona, Illinois, behind a grain bin. They could jump out and chase me all the way to the house. And I better run because it's dangerous. Okay, now get this. Here's why that logic completely falls apart. The FBI reports that 80%, I'm going to an extreme here, be patient with me, 80% of murders happen as a result of friends, family, or loved ones. So by that logic, you should be more afraid to walk into Christmas with your family than down a dark alley. The logic falls apart, right? Do you know why? It's because we take out our anger on the people we love the most. You can button it up at work. You can hold it together from nine to five. You can button it up when you're in the car. You can button it up when you're, I don't know, doing whatever activity it is that you do. When you're at the gym, when you're offended, you can turn the TV off, but man, it comes out somewhere. And it usually comes out on the people we love the most. And there's a danger to our anger. Man, the people that are my favorite people in the world are the ones I struggle with my anger the most with. There's always a, a list of reasons why they took me over the breaking point, past the brink. They're always the reason after the but. We can't live that way. It's not the way that we've been called to. It's not what we've been redeemed to be. And if you want healing, if you want to forgive what you've endured in your life, I'm telling you something. The worst part is that we take advantage of relational equity with the ones that we love, and that's manipulation. And if we want genuine healing, if you want to love your spouse better, if you want to love your kids better, you want to function with more, uh, I'm sorry, and, and period, then we've got to get to the real heart solution. So how are we going to get to a solution? Where is it that we're going to make a new habit? What is the solution to the anger problem that we're all aware of? And Jesus says this. He says that we have to be a people who own it. You know what your takeaways are for the entirety of a seven-week series? You have to own it. You've got to recognize in this particular week the source of your anger. But you know what owning it really means? You've heard these words, but it's, it's so countercultural that it makes your skin crawl to ever think about actually living this out. We confess 
and we repent. That's what it looks like when followers of Christ own it. If you haven't been a follower of Christ, you're new to this, I want you to understand something. This is God's economy, And it's unfair, but it's not unfair in your direction. It's, it's unfair the mercy he extends to us. We just don't deserve it. He's so good. He's just so kind in his mercy. And so we confess that there's a problem here. I've got to recognize that there is a source to my anger, and I've got to come clean with it. There's a real problem. You need to have the courage to have a conversation with somebody you love about the source of your anger. It looks like confrontation, but in your anger, do not sin. We don't want to just bury it. We don't want to cover up over it. We want to repent. Repent means I've lived my entire life going my direction, making my plans. This is, it, it's, it's lots of justifying my actions. It's lots of justifying my, my anger and, and, and all of this. And yet now that I've been confronted with it, if I'm really being honest, my way hasn't yielded the life I thought it would after 36 years. And, and so I'm going to repent and follow Jesus. I've confessed in this. I've got a problem over here doing it my way. And so in this repentance process, I now follow Jesus. And if you've never done that before, or you've never been in your Bible to see what following Jesus looks like, then that's a mystery. And so if you're not careful, your attempt at repentance will just be another attempt at doing it your way. This is why we stress community. This is why we plead with you to be a part of community, that you would find out that everybody else in the room is battling with the same shame and strongholds that you are, and that those of us that are successful have found the same source of freedom at the foot of the cross in Jesus, because he knows it all anyway, because he sees it all. And and what he asks in a heart response is that you would own it and that you would turn away from it. Oh man, I I know that, I don't know what the solution looks like yet, but I know what the problem is and I'm done with it. This This is how we should look dramatically different than the world around us. You don't have to hide anything here. We're going to get to the solution. And the invitation, what Christ followers should practice on a regular basis, is owning it, confessing, and repenting. The book, Creatures of Habit, we'd still encourage you to get it because you could jump in at any point on this, says that your next step in forming a new habit looks a lot like this. If you want to, I'd encourage you to take your phone, take a screenshot of this slide while it's up. It's a whole variety of new habits that you could form in a new next step of of not being controlled by your anger. You could learn to calm down before you react. You could exercise. You could let go correctly and, and, and learn to set up some guardrails. Start to practice forgiveness. Give anger an expiration date and remind yourself all the time that God is in control. It's a whole bunch of things. That's why it's too many for you to just remember. It's too many to just say, okay, I'm going to give up my anger. I'm going to do it right this time. I'm going to form all these new habits. You know what Jesus continued to say in Matthew chapter 5? I love this because he he, he continued to preach, taught through a whole bunch of other topics that that we're going to get to. And then he gets to this place uh, near the end of chapter 5 in verse 43, about 20 verses later. And he says this, he comes back to anger. He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Did you catch what he said? Love your enemies and pray for them. You got real source to your anger? Do you got legitimate reason for being angry? I challenge you, by the extent of the grace that Christ has shown you, to love others that way. I challenge you Uh, The scripture goes on to say, verse 48, to be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know what that word perfect means? It means to be made complete. As your heavenly Father is complete and perfect in his love and his mercy and, and his extension of grace to you, be perfect like he is. You want to do something that's a next step, I dare you to love your enemies. 
Remember at your wedding, maybe you even got a craft hanging up in your house that says, love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, doesn't keep a record of a wrong suffered, doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices in truth. It always protects, always hopes, always perseveres, never fails. I dare you to extend that kind of love to your enemies, to the ones that provoke you that deeply. Because this is how Christ has loved you. And any one of you that's in Christ, you're a new creation. You don't have to be that old person anymore. You can be made new in Christ. These new habits are sourced out of a new heart. So I'm going to love irrationally. I'm going to pray for my enemies. Like real, like God, I need need you to do something in their heart. They need you as desperately as I once did. And because of that, I'm going to extend an unnatural amount of grace. And I'm going to allow a healing to take place at the core of my heart that I didn't even think was possible. We should be known for our lack of anger. We've had eternity hemmed up by Christ himself. We are going to live on this side of the butt. We're going to live as people who confess and repent. We're going to own our shortcomings that Christ may make us complete, holy as he is holy. Perfect. That's the goal.